It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question uh, to, the, to the Premier. Premier, you know, what I'm concerned about is in, um, under your leadership in Ontario, if you're well connected, you get ahead. Uh, the middle class is shrinking, and many families are struggling to get by with a, a part time job, minimum wage job at best. We have 10 days left in this uh, session before the government is going to break Order. for Christmas. Premier, on which of those 10 days are you going to finally bring forward your jobs plan to restore hope to the people of Ontario who desperately need a change of course and a jobs plan starting now? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, the reality is that we have a plan, Mr. Speaker, and there are jobs coming to this province. And I have a list of companies, Mr. Speaker, who have created jobs and who have expanded in order to uh, to employ more people, Mr. Speaker. I think what the leader of the opposition is asking me is whether I will adopt his plan, Mr. Speaker, and his plan would actually cut jobs out of uh, the province, Mr. Speaker. It would actually slash services across government, and that's not what we're going to do. We believe that making the investments in people and the investments in infrastructure and the investments in a business climate that will bring business to the province, that those investments are the ones that we should be making, Mr. Speaker. That's our plan. That is what we're doing, and jobs are coming to this province, Mr. Speaker. Sir, thank you. Supplementary. Well, if the Premier calls a loss of 300,000 manufacturing jobs, the kind of province where families are lucky to get a part-time job or a minimum wage job just to pay the bills, if that's what the Premier calls a plan, then clearly, Speaker, it's time to toss out the plan, toss out the government, and bring in a team that can lead us back to economic recovery. Premier, you know what? I invite you to go and tell the people of Leamington, Ontario, that your plan is working. 800 families now out of work. Farmers whose product is not going to get to market. Incredible impact on the community. You know, Rick Nichols and I were there, and I want to salute Rick for fighting for the people in his community to restore some hope to Leamington. And we did an open town hall meeting, invited anybody from the community to come in. And I saw the pain of families Order. who are going to lose their jobs. They're worried about their pension, their mortgages, Questions. and how they're going to get by with a minimum wage part-time job at best. Premier, I listen directly to the people of Leamington. Why don't you actually hold an open town Thank hall you. yourself and tell them that Thank you're you. working? Opposition knows I was in I was in Leamington before he got there, Mr. Speaker. I had a meeting with the people who are working to make sure that. That'll do. Premier. Speaker, we included his member in that meeting. He was part of he was part of the meeting. We talked with the folks who are intimately involved in creating opportunities and making sure that first of all the employees the member from Renfrew come to order and that there is a, there is a robust plan going forward. I think what the people of Leamington need, want to know, Mr. Speaker, is that we are on the ground that we are going to work with them to make sure that we find a way to replace those jobs and make sure that people will come have to opportunities. That's why we We've already flowed $200,000, Mr. Speaker, to facilitate that process, and we will put everything we can into support that Thank community, you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. I think it's a study in, in contrast, Speaker, because when the Premier went to Leamington, she had a closed-door backroom meeting and then skipped out of town as fast as she could. Rick Nichols and I, we had an open town hall to hear directly from the people of our province to talk about our plan to actually bring hopes back to the community. Your problem, Premier, is you seem to think that job losses are a temporary inconvenience, that they're a nuisance that can be simply solved by a Minister of Rural Affairs will come to order. That's not going to cut it. I think you should go back to Leamington and have a town hall. And if you want to tell me your plan is working, then by all means do so. But I'll ask you to tell them this. What are your plans that you've brought through since you and I had a deal to clear the decks? Is it a 24-7 emergency rescue for cats and dogs? Is it the smoking on patios? Is it banning water, cooler, water heater salesmen? Which of those three Answer. parts of your plan, Premier, will bring a single job back to people of Leamington, Ontario?
member from Renfrew will withdraw. And that's number two. And I don't stand for you to have a quiet moment to heckle. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I, I, I know that the member, I know that the leader of the opposition knows that I am not averse to having open discussion, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. In here, fact, here. the leader of the opposition takes every opportunity to stand up and tell me that we do too much conversation, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and that is absolutely not the case. The meeting we had in Leamington was a working meeting, Mr. Speaker. It was a meeting with people who understand that community. And I quite sure that the people who came to the town hall were some of those same people and that's as it should be mr speaker we are going to work we are going to work with the community i know that the uh, the uh, leader of the uh, opposition heard from residents that, that the federal government changes to food packaging rules have had an impact the member from northumberland quinty west will come to order anyone, Mr. Speaker. I'm saying that that's one Answer. of the things that the Leader of the Opposition heard, so we need to work with the federal government, we need to work with the community yeah, yeah. to make sure we find a way to make sure those Thank people you. have jobs and that industry can thrive, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. New question. Yep. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, back to Those meetings are not exactly transparent. They're not open. And the problem I have is that if you wall yourself up at Queen's Park, you wall yourselves up with inside advisors, you don't have an open town hall, you're never going to understand what's actually happening in communities across our great province of Ontario. Premier, the middle class is being hollowed out. My Ontario will always build things, we'll always make things, we'll sell products around the world. We can beat the best of the best. But we're not going to do that with skyrocketing energy rates, more and more red tape, and a premier whose priority seems to be water heater salesman, 24-7 rescue, and getting a pat in the back from Al Gore for driving those hydro rates through the roof in the first place. i got to wonder where your priorities are. So let me ask you this, Premier. The problem in the province of Ontario, we're hollowing out the middle class and minimum wage jobs are the only jobs people can get. So is this your measure of success? That your odds of you're working in Ontario have now doubled, that it's a minimum wage job, that the proportion of minimum wage jobs in the province of Ontario is up 100 per cent. Thank you. My vision, middle class jobs, no more minimum wage jobs. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me let me just say that. The plan that we have got in place is a rational plan, Mr. Speaker. The long-term energy plan is going to be uh, released today. It's part of that plan, Mr. Speaker, because we understand that if we can make the right investments in people, the right investments in infrastructure, and create a dynamic business climate, Mr. Speaker, such as the business climate that Murdoch Mer Mer Mysteries thrives in, Mr. Speaker, then we can bring business and we can bring talent to this province, Mr. Speaker. That is our plan. There are a lot of things. That's on the CBC. Member from Prince Edward Hastings got one there. Carry on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I just I welcome I welcome the critique of the leader of the opposition, Answer. Mr. Speaker. And there are many things to critique, but telling me that I haven't been out talking to people in this province, that's not one of them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. You know, uh, the few references to Murdoch Mysteries, we're, we're thrilled that they're here, and maybe they can help the OPP investigate your office. <laughs> Figure out, maybe they can help you locate where Chris Moss has run to in the province as well. Look, I, I got to tell you, I, 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 I know it's hard to take, but, but facts are stubborn things. And the facts tell us that we've lost over 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Under your leadership, the concern I have is that pace has accelerated. We've lost an additional 38,000 manufacturing the jobs. Minister under training your college and universities the fact come of the matter to order. is, the number of minimum wage jobs, that a proportion of all jobs, has doubled. So if you lose your job, you're lucky to get a minimum wage or a part-time job in Liberal Ontario. Question. That's why I'm going to fight for change each and every day. Let's get hydro rates under control. Let's get taxes down. Let's close down the College of Trades. Let's put people and grow the middle class. Thank you. So put them all minimum wage jobs. You see it, please? You see it, please? 
Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition can diminish the good jobs in the film industry and television industry, Mr. Speaker, but those are very important jobs, and it's a very important industry for this province. And I believe that those investments that we need to make are investments in our strengths, playing to our strengths, and that is one of our strengths, Mr. Speaker. I also want to just say, Order. Mr. Speaker, in answer to the Leader of the Opposition's question, when he talks about good jobs, I would ask him back what part of right-to-work legislation that is driving jobs down to the bottom, what part of that creates good jobs, Mr. Speaker? That's his labor policy, and you're not going there. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Final supplementary. When, when Camaro is going to Michigan, when Cat goes to Indiana, your role, put your head in the sand and kiss the manufacturing jobs goodbye. I will do everything I can to grow our middle class, put people into good jobs, give them a better future. I've got a plan to bring 300,000 manufacturing jobs into our province. Your record, your record, one of more minimum wage jobs. And I'll tell you this too, Premier, that if you're a new Canadian, like my grandparents were, they came to this province because they believed they'd have a better future by working hard. They started a business. New Canadians under the Liberal government, 20 per cent of minimum wage jobs today. They're the calling behind this bill. Come to order. This the path is taking us to bankruptcy. We're calling out our middle class. I've got a plan to modernize our labour laws, get our energy rates under control, lower taxes, get Ontario back in its feet, and make our middle class the envy of the province of I mean, the entire country, top among the provinces. That's our plan. Where the heck is yours? Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm hoping some people are recognizing the number of times they've been talked to. I think I will repeat it again. Not really. Premier. Mr. Speaker, so since June 2009, which was the low after the recession, there are 460,900 net new jobs in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. There are net new jobs at Toyota, Ford, GM, Green Arc Tire Manufacturing, Nutera, Pillar 5 Pharma, Lambton Conveyor, all across the province, Mr. Speaker, there are net new jobs. But let's be perfectly clear. The leader of the opposition's plan would cut tens of thousands of jobs out of this province, Mr. Speaker, would undermine labour, Mr. Speaker, and thereby undermine the ability of people to earn a good wage and undermine the workplace safety, Mr. Speaker, that has been gained over decades and decades of strong labour laws in this province. The, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, when he talks about modernizing labour, he's talking about undermining the gains and protections that have made, been, by, been made by organized labour over the last hundred years. That's what he's talking about, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm not getting things quiet for you to heckle. I'm getting things quiet so that we can hear the next question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. For Ontarians paying the highest electricity bills in the country, the latest promises from the Liberal government of some relief on the hydro bills rings pretty hollow. Why should consumers believe the government has now got a plan when they haven't stuck to any of the other long-term energy plans they developed over a decade in office? Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I would have thought that the leader of the third party would like to see a plan that was updated, Mr. Speaker, and that plan will be uh, coming out today. And the new plan, Mr. Speaker, is a balanced approach to meet the energy needs that we have today. I mean, the reality of an energy plan, Mr. Speaker, is that it has to take into account the conditions that exist at the time that the plan is in place. So this plan is based on what we have heard from First Nation and Métis communities, Mr. Speaker, from energy stakeholders 
from municipalities and consumers from across the province. That's what we have based this plan on, Mr. Speaker. And since 2003, what we have done is we have modernized an electricity system that was severely out of date, Mr. Speaker, that needed investment, that needed upgrading. That's the work that we've been doing, and it's only responsible, Mr. Speaker, that we would Answer. continue that work. That's what the long-term energy plan is about. Speaker, for 10 years, the government's played political games with electricity policy, and people are stuck paying the skyrocketing bills that resulted. When the Liberal government first announced plans to invest in new nuclear plants, New Democrats said that that plan was expensive and that plan was unnecessary. For eight years, the Liberals ignored us and instead spent $180 million on contracts for a project that they are now finally abandoning. Why did it take nearly a decade and millions upon millions upon millions of wasted dollars for the government to conclude the obvious, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and I know that the leader of the third party knows that the work that was done in preparation for new nuclear is not work that is it goes to waste, Mr. Speaker. That is work that can be used if and when we need to uh, we need to revisit those plans. But, Mr. Speaker, it would be irresponsible of us, in the face of all of the evidence, to go ahead and to build at this point. But, Mr. Speaker, what's interesting is the leader of the third party is criticizing us for having a plan. She's criticizing us for one aspect of preparation that we were making, given the best advice, and now, Mr. Speaker, we, have, we are putting in place a long-term energy plan. We've created 31,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, with our clean energy policies, none of which the leader of the third party has supported, Mr. Speaker. I would have expected that she would have Answer. thought that those were a good idea, but in fact, Mr. Speaker, she doesn't have a plan and she's not supporting ours. It's Thank curious, you. Mr. Speaker, as to how she thinks we should move forward. Thank you. Well, Speaker, this isn't the only example. The Liberal government has already signed $950 million in new contracts for refurbishment of the Darlington nuclear plant, but we don't know what the final price tag is. Does the Premier think it's a good idea to spend nearly a billion dollars without having a final price tag, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, it is responsible for the government to plan for future need. It, was, it is responsible for the government to have a plan to make sure that we have the capacity to generate the energy that's needed. The problem when we came into office in 2003, Mr. Speaker, was that there was not enough capacity. We did not have the energy that was needed. We were facing brownouts and blackouts, Mr. Speaker, and we knew that we needed to make investments in order to have the capacity that was necessary. That that's what we have done. The long-term energy plan will lay out how we determine that we need to go forward. I hope that the leader of the third party will take a look at it and see that in that plan is that future blueprint Answer. for the energy needs of the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your questions? Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. For Ontario families and businesses paying the highest electricity rates in Canada, this doesn't look like a plan for affordable power. It looks like a desperate government trying to hold on to political power. That's right. Whether it's the $180 million Speaker spent on nuclear plans that were abandoned or the nearly $1 billion spent on refurbishment plans without a final price tag or the billion dollars uh, spent on moving gas plants to save a couple of Liberal seats. How can the Premier expect the people to believe that this government has a plan to make electricity affordable? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I just want to speak to the uh, I want to speak to the uh, programs that we've got in place that actually help business to deal with energy prices, Mr. Speaker. So the industrial electricity incentive um, eligible companies qualify for electricity rates that are among the lowest in North America in exchange for creating new jobs and bringing new investment into the province. Again, Mr. Speaker, that's something that I would have thought that both opposition parties would support. The industrial Cons conservation initiative, which helps large consumers save on cost by putting incentives in place to shift their electricity consumption to off-peak hours. That's something that allows companies to save business, to save uh, money. And then the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, Mr. Speaker, reduces electricity prices for large northern industrial consumers by 25 percent. All of 
of those programs, Mr. Speaker, are in recognition of the fact that businesses need yes, to sir. have the capacity to be competitive. I would have thought that the leader of the third party would have supported those programs, yes, Mr. Yes. Speaker. Speaker, people are telling us that they need help, and the solution from the Liberals is just get used to it. Yep. Jennifer from Niagara wrote to say, quote, our system is totally broken. There is a point of no return and a ceiling that is inevitable before you simply cannot give any more. What does the Premier have to offer people like Jennifer besides more of the same? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So we have a number of programs that uh, I know that the leader of the third party will want to inform her constituents about. The Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, which uh, the leader of the third party knows helps families and small businesses, takes 10 percent off uh, hydro bills. The Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit saves uh, qualifying individuals about $963 a year, Mr. Speaker, and up to $1,097 for qualifying seniors. The Northern Ontario Energy Credit saves another uh, up to $210 a year. The Low Income Energy Assistance Program and the Save on Energy Home Assistance Program, Mr. Speaker. So we have a number of plans in place that save people money who uh, who qualify for those programs, Mr. Speaker. But I think what's important is that the leader of the third party Answer. be upfront with the reality that they have no plan, Mr. Speaker. And the fact that they have no plan is is not it's not responsible, Mr. Speaker, when they attack our plan. Here, here. Final supplementary. Speaker, people are hoping this government will actually offer some relief, but all they hear are the same empty promises from the Liberals, and they're stuck paying the bills for a decade of failed Liberal policy. For 10 years, they've watched their bills climb, Speaker, as they pay for the price of Liberals' energy misadventures in this province. The government wasted billions in public dollars, and it's gone straight uh, to the people's bills. The environment. What relief will they offer them to Today, Speaker. Thank you, Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I've already outlined some of the programs that we have in place that are targeted directly at people and people in their homes, so that they can save money. The uh, the uh, Minister of Energy will bring will be bringing out the long-term energy plan today, and uh, I know that the uh, I know that the House will be interested that we are focusing on conservation, Mr. Speaker. That we believe that it's extremely important that we do everything we can to help people to conserve on energy because. The cheapest megawatt, Mr. Speaker, is one that's not used, and so we are working very hard to make sure we have the right supports and incentives in place, Mr. Speaker, to help people to save money. I hope that the leader of the third party, although she has no plan, that she will look at the plan that we are putting in place and that she will be able to support those incentives because, Mr. Speaker, those plans are very, very responsible in terms of helping people to deal with the, uh, the realities of energy in the province. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Uh, later today, the Liberals will introduce a short-term energy plan. By all accounts, it will be one that continues the decade-long policy that hikes electricity rates and power bills for Ontarians. Now, Speaker, telling Ontario job creators to control their own energy bills signals a vast departure from Ontario's traditional industrial policy that made us an economic powerhouse from Confederation right up until a decade ago when they assumed power. Doesn't the Premier think that the massive increases on energy bills over the last decade and the coinciding decline of our manufacturing sector actually says the government, not our job creators, should get their energy prices under control? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I would just uh, I would just draw to the attention of the leader, uh, or the leader, the um, the member of the opposition, that that electricity prices for large uh, large industrial consumers remain in line with the major neighboring jurisdictions. They're competitive, Mr. Speaker, with New York, with Michigan, with Pennsylvania. That's that's the pro that's the program we put in place. Those energy prices are competitive, Mr. Speaker. But I I really believe that if we think that we can take lessons from the opposition on how to run the energy sector, Mr. Speaker. We'll be in a sorry state. From 1996 to 2003, when that government was in office, Mr. Speaker, capacity fell by 6 percent and demand rose by 8 percent, Mr. Speaker. They increased the use of dirty coal by 127 percent. In 2002, Ontario paid $500 million to import electricity. In 2003, Ontario paid $400 million to import electricity, Mr. Speaker. We 
are, we have put in place the investments that are necessary to have a stable electricity sector, Mr. Speaker. Thank That's you. why we're bringing in a long-term energy plan. Thank you. Supplementary. Not true, Speaker. I stood in this House last week and read right into the record that the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association said that rates here in Ontario are much higher to the tune of 129 percent in some jurisdictions in the United States, including Chicago, Detroit, and Nashville. They're beating us out. And she knows full well, Speaker, that it is her government's reliance on subsidized wind and solar that has put us in this place. She knows full well, Speaker, that it's her cancellation of $181 million of nuclear reactors that is put us in this place, Speaker. And she knows, Speaker, that it is her reliance on seats in Mississauga and Oakville that has put us in this place, Speaker. And we can only conclude that they are announcing the long-term energy plan today to, to distract from her appearance at the Gas Plants Committee tomorrow. Speaker, if she is serious about fixing energy prices in the province of Ontario, Question. she wants the jobs to come back. There's only one way forward, and it is Tim Hudak's plan on affordable energy. She can adopt that plan today. She Thank can you. Put it on forward and she can ensure that Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Order, please. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the uh, the member of uh, of the opposition um, claims that her party wants to reduce hydro rates, Mr. Speaker, but at the same time, they want to spend $15 billion on generating new nuclear that is not necessary, Mr. Speaker. So I would, I would question the very premise of uh, of the, uh, the members uh, of the members' contention, Mr. Speaker. We have put in place programs that support industrial users, Mr. Speaker, who are competitive. I, uh, I talked about the uh, the programs that we've got in place: the Industrial Electricity Incentive, the Industrial Conservation Initiative, and the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, Mr. Speaker. But the member of the opposition is correct. We have made investments in the electricity sector, much-needed investments, Mr. Speaker, in a system that were that was neglected by the previous government, Mr. Speaker. Those those investments have meant that we have a stable supply, Mr. Speaker, that we have a future plan, none of which were in place when we came into office after their regime, Mr. Speaker. Your question, to Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. The government has, by its own admission, signed nearly $1 billion worth of contracts for nuclear refurbishment at Darlington. But by their own admission, they don't know the final price tag. Why is the Premier making a billion-dollar down payment when she doesn't know the final cost? Premier? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, I just, I just want to analyze the questions that have been coming from uh, the third party, Mr. Speaker. They do not support new nuclear. Fair enough. They do not support refurbishment, Mr. Speaker. They do not support our green energy policies, Mr. Speaker. It's very questionable the what Prince they support, Edward Mr. Hastings Speaker. What we do know is that there is not a plan in place. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we believe that refurbishment, refurbishment is necessary. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we believe that the new nuclear bill is not necessary. Yes, we believe that our green energy policies, which have taken coal offline, Mr. Speaker, and have cleaned up the air in this here. province, that that is the right way to go. I would ask yes, the member what their plan is, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm sorry that the Premier didn't see fit to answer the question. Sadly, this is nothing new for the Liberal government. Chatham, they signed we'll private order. power contracts for gas plants that left us with a billion-dollar bill. They added another $180 million to our hydro bills with a plan for new nuclear plants that weren't going to be built. Does the Premier think it's wise? to spend another billion dollars on a refurbishment plan when she doesn't even know what the price tag is going to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think it's wise to have a plan. I think it's wise to understand how we are going to generate energy for this province, how we are going to support the citizens of this province so that they will have a stable energy supply, Mr. Speaker. I think it's wise to make sure that we have the programs in place and the supports and incentives in place so that business can be competitive, 
so that individuals can afford their uh, their energy prices, Mr. Speaker. And I think it is wise, Mr. Speaker, to have that plan in place for years to come, so that we are not in a reactive mode, Mr. Speaker, to every populist idea that comes along. And so, having that plan, having that long-term energy plan in place, which does have to be retooled from time to time, that is our process, and that's the plan that will be released today, Mr. Speaker. Question. The member from Scarborough, Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Congestion is stifling growth and economic opportunities in my riding of Scarborough, Guildwood. It hurts our businesses and is affecting the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area's standing as a competitive global region. Civic and business leaders from all sides of the political spectrum have joined the movement for the greater investment in transportation infrastructure. One of those leaders is John Tory from Civic Action, who spoke this morning about right Civic there. Action's right Your 32 campaign and transportation's impact on people's quality of life. I'm proud to say that before I joined this legislature, I was formally a part of this organization. Congestion comes with a $6 billion annual cost to commuters and the economy in the GTHA, Canada's most significant urban regional economy, according to OECD. Question. In order for us to grow and remain competitive, gridlock must be addressed. Speaker, will the minister inform this House on what the government Thank is you. doing to help solve congestion crisis in minister our region? Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, and I want to thank the uh, member for Scarborough Guildwood. Uh, this is uh, a remarkable woman who has had a lifetime of commitment to transit or work at uh, Civic Action and now as an MPP in this House. I want to thank her. I want to thank Mr. Tory for joining us today uh, for his leadership. Uh, it's been quite remarkable as a journalist. Um, and uh, he was having breakfast this morning promoting it. Mr. Speaker, we are at over $19 billion in public transit investments in the Toronto Hamilton area alone. We will exceed $20 billion in next year's budget. This is a record level of spending. 15 major rapid transit projects, Mr. Speaker, being built all across the region, reducing congestion, Mr. Speaker. We are picking up over 90 percent of the transit costs. Mr. Speaker, the federal government's contributions is 3.85 percent, Mr. Speaker, which I think is a global record for, for a lack of investment by a national Thank government, you. Mr. Speaker, and the only Thank record you. they're breaking is disinvestment. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for your answer. It is important to hear that the Ontario Liberal government has taken transportation investments seriously, including the commitment to a fully funded subway to Scarborough. It has been unfortunate that the federal government has largely been missing in action on dedicated, sustainable investments in public transit in transportation in Ontario. I agree, in order for the GTHA to prosper and remain competitive, the federal government must step up and pay their fair share. Recently, you and I were at an announcement at the Union Pearson Express. This major transportation investment will certainly help to reduce congestion on our roads and help travellers in their commute to the airport. Speaker, will the minister give an update to this House on the Union Pearson Express project? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The project is ahead of budget and on time. Uh, this is a $456 million project. It will take 1.2 million, million cars off of the line, uh, off the road, Mr. Speaker. It's very important. And, Mr. Speaker, you know, Mr. Tory asked us to try and come up with a clear position. Mr. Speaker, we know that the party opposite doesn't like automobiles because they didn't want to lend any money to Chrysler or General Motors and they would have killed our auto sector. They want to take about half of the projects that are on Bob Barjay's books and cancel every LRT project, Mr. Speaker. That would throw, literally throw Bombardier under the bus and mean thousands and thousands of job losses. And Mr. Speaker, I know they canceled Eglinton the first time because they didn't like subways. Now they, now, now they want to cancel it because it, it's an LRT. I'm really confused. They hated subways before and filled them in. Now they hate LRTs and fill them in. Thank you. I'm sure if we said we put a bu stop the clock, please. Stop the clock, please. I, uh, I continually listen carefully to all questions and answers, and there are times in which the government uh, have not stayed on policy, and I'm going to remind everyone that the questions are on policy and the answers are on government policy, and I appreciate you staying so. I, uh, I don't want any interruptions while I'm trying to explain something. 
New question, the member from Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, I want to ask the Premier how she and her minister can justify standing by their $9.3 million man. With every new revelation of the orange scandal, two things become ever more clear. First is that Chris Mazza engaged in a premeditated scheme to defraud our health care system of millions of dollars. But just as clear is the fact that the government is as guilty as Mazza for the waste and failing our frontline people, our patients, and our taxpayers. Not only did Chris Mazza siphon millions of dollars through his corporate scheme, but we now learn that millions more were siphoned and were never reported through the Sunshine List. So I ask the Premier this. How can she justify defending a man who defrauded our health care system of millions? And what does this latest revelation about Thank our you. public disclosure system say? Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, I'm not defending. Uh, I'm not defending this man or his actions, Mr. Speaker. I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to speak to the specifics, but we have made huge changes at Orange, Mr. Speaker. We have made huge changes that address the issues that were raised by this set of circumstances, Mr. Speaker. But to suggest that I'm defending those actions is absolutely not accurate, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, this is why the people of this province have lost confidence in this government. Rather than show leadership, the Premier and her ministers hide behind process and the veil of being able to wash their hands and deflecting responsibility. Speaker, is there any department in this government at all that the people of this province can trust? Nope. Now it's the salary disclosure process through the Ministry of Finance that we can no longer trust. Millions of dollars of salary were siphoned by Mazza. The public salary disclosure system failed to disclose millions of dollars. Are we to believe that Mazza's salaries are the only ones that have been hidden and that haven't been disclosed by that salary disclosure system? Will the Premier agree Question. to call in the Auditor General to, to do an audit of the salary disclosure system in the Ministry of Finance so that we Thank know you. what's going on in this government? Please. You see it, please. Thank you. The member from Dufferin Caledon will come to order. The member from Durham will come to order. Premier. Health and long-term care. For so long-term care. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, I have said before, and I say again, that Dr. Mazza and his former board. Uh, abused the trust that was placed in them. Speaker, he abused the trust that was placed in him. The member opposite knows full well that he is not on my payroll. Speaker, as soon as we became, became aware of those abuses, Speaker, we I ordered a forensic audit. The Ministry of Finance sent in a forensic audit team. Speaker. The, the uh, report from that forensic audit team has gone to the OPP where it belongs, Speaker. The member opposite knows that there is an OPP investigation underway. That is uh, an important part of due process, which I know the member opposite is not Answer. very uh, fond of. But in the meantime, Speaker, Orange continues to get stronger and Order, better please. every single day. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la ministre de la Santé et des Soins de longue durée. Air ambulance is an essential service in Ontario. People's lives depend on it. But instead of making sure that health care dollars were going towards saving lives, almost 10 million of it went right into the pocket of Dr. Mazza. The rules were in place against that, but the government chose not to enforce them. See no evil, hear no evil. Yep. Whistleblower had gone to the government in 2010. They came to the New Democrats. We asked question plan blank on November 16, 2010. What was Mazza's salary? We gave you the mandate to go look into his salary because whistleblower had told us that things had gone wrong. Why did the government pay Mazza nine? 
$6.3 million. Why didn't they do their job? Question. Why didn't they go look into Maz's salary back in 2010 Everything and avoid okay. all Thank of you. this? Speaker, I think uh, when it comes to Orange, when we became aware of the abuse, Speaker, we did take action. There is an entirely new board, a new volunteer board, doing excellent work at Orange, Speaker. The OPP are, have an investigation underway, Speaker. Let me make it very clear. This kind of abuse of the trust of the people of this province is completely unacceptable. That's why we took the very strong action that we did, and that is why Orange is into a new chapter, Speaker. Two supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the government stood by and allowed NASA to use basically public money as a cash for life program. They stood by while he drove this organization into the ground. $9.3 million could have hired 160 nurses, could have cared for 2,000 people on home care. The reason Chris Mazza was paid $9.3 million wasn't because he cleverly hook-winned the government. It was because the government never bothered to look into Orange. They fail at their primary mandates of over oversight. They fail to do their job. That leaves us with what keeps it from happening again? What reassurance can she give us that there isn't Question. dozens of other oranges out there? Well, there are. Thank you. well Speaker, I know that uh, this is an issue that has received much attention from committees in this House, Speaker, and I welcome that. But I think it's very important that people acknowledge how the strengthening that has gone on at Orange. Uh, Speaker, uh, Orange must now comply with the Broader Sector, uh, Sector Accountability Act. They must publicly report expenses, submit detailed financial reports. They are now subject to freedom of information requests. Salaries for Orange executives are posted online. They have a new conflict of interest policy, establishing clear rules for employees' contact. They have a new patient advocate speaker who works with patients to address any concerns they may have. Uh, they have uh, implemented several changes to en enhance patient safety. Additional training for helicopter pilots, including Answer. controlled access into terrain. They've revised the operating procedures for night operations, including operations into black hole sites. They're installing uh, solar lighting at night. Thank you. Your question to members from Ottawa Orleans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, one of the biggest challenges we face is ensuring our senior citizens and patients with specialized needs receive the highest quality of care. Studies have shown that roughly 75 per cent of seniors with complex conditions who are discharged from hospitals receive care from six or more physicians, and 30 per cent of get their drugs from three or more pharmacies. This creates challenges that increase the cost of care. My constituents in Ottawa Orleans want to be assured that they or their family need health services. They will receive coordinated care without gaps and duplication. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, could the minister please update the House on some of the ways the Ontario government is working to strengthen community health care? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker. It's important to understand that about 5% of Ontarians actually account for two thirds of our health care spending. It's very important that those people with complex needs get access to coordinated care so all of the providers who, who uh, care for that individual come together to develop one plan of care that meets the needs and the hopes and the aspirations of that patient. I am delighted, Speaker, that 37 community health links have been established across the province and more are on the way. It is this kind of coordinated care that, that smooths the transition Positions of care for complex patients, it will ensure, Speaker, that they get the right care at the right time and in the right place. This is much better care for those individuals, yes, and it also results in better value for our precious health care dollars. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. I know that our government takes community health care seriously. When different health care providers work as a team to care for a patient, they can better coordinate the full patient journey through the health system, leading to better care for patients. Health links have certainly helped to ensure that patients with complex conditions receive, receive the right care at the right time 
in the right place. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians and rural communities face unique challenges when it comes to providing care. I know that what work may work in a larger area does not necessarily translate to small communities. Speaker, through you to the minister, could the minister update the House of what our government is doing to strengthen health care in rural communities across the province? Thank you, Minister. To the Minister of Rural Affairs. Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Ottawa or Leeds for his interest and advocacy in this important issue. Communities in rural Ontario face some unique challenges, and our government is committed to strengthening them by improving health services and access to care. Wow. That's why we have and will continue to help out health links in a number of rural and northern areas. Very important. Just last Monday, I was in the wonderful community of Aurelia and was happy to announce that our government is providing $60,000 to each health link wow. to help identify high-risk patients and develop individualized care plans. Rural communities already exhibit a high degree of collaboration between the health and social sectors, but HealthLinks provides a far more venue for them to connect. Moving forward, rural HealthLinks will have the flexibility to address unique needs in their communities, including satellite and community paramedicine. Our government is focused on strengthening rural communities and will continue to work with the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care to ensure our rural populations have access to services and high-quality patient care. Question. Member from Renton, Kent, Middlesex. Uh, thank you, and Mr. Speaker. I was just wondering if the uh, Premier is expected to come back. No. Okay, uh, Speaker. Then my question, uh, I guess, will be for the Minister of Finance. Minister, while your Premier was out jogging, Ontario lost 300,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs. You can almost run the alphabet, Minister, from Sklar, Pepler, and Ajax to the General Motors transmission and assembly plants in Windsor. The list in between is long, Minister. Exxon Mobil Chemical Films in Belleville, Saputo Dairy in Brampton, Navistar in Chatham, Daimler Trucks in London and St. Thomas, and its bus factory in Mississauga. Then there's Edska in Niagara Falls, the General Motors Camaro production in Oshawa, as well as its 110-year operation in St. Catharines. Minister, I can keep going on. Baskin Robbins in Peterborough, John Deere in Welland, Southwire Cable in Stouffville. As we approach Christmas and the New Year, Minister, workers in the, these communities have lost hope. Minister, where is your job you. plan for the people of Ontario? Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question because it allows me the opportunity to once again remind the members opposite that our jobs plan has been working to the extent that we've created over 470,000 net new jobs since the depths of the recession. We've got over 600,000 new jobs that have been created since 2003, and we recognize that the market is changing, and we must do everything in our power to continue to invest and stimulate that growth, things that the member opposite has opposed, Mr. Speaker. So let me cite some issues. We've created more jobs in Ericsson, Canada, in Ottawa, 35,000 to 105 jobs. We've created more jobs in Cambridge because of Toyota. We brought in Ford and supported them in Oakville. We were the ones that supported GM in Ingersoll. We've done more in St. Mary's, Ontario, to create more jobs because we recognize the change in manufacturing yes, sector. We've done so in Brantford. We've done so in Brockville. We've done so in Appleport, Ontario. We've done so in Wallaceburg, Ontario, and Thank in you. Bradford and in Woodstock. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Finance. Minister, the Heinz plant in Leamington and your Premier's recent drive-by photo op is just another example of your careless approach to Ontario's ailing manufacturing sector. Minister, here are the facts about your pathetic job-killing plan. One million people are out of work in Ontario today. 300,000 net manufacturing jobs have been lost. Right. Ontario is dead last, dead last, Minister, in wage growth in Canada, and our middle class has been gutted by your Liberal government. But, Minister, the good thing is it doesn't have to be this way. Only Tim Hudak and the Ontario PECs understand the severity of Ontario's jobs crisis, and only Tim Hudak and the Ontario PCs have put forward a bold plan to modernize Ontario's, uh, Ontario's labour laws and deal with the thousands of job losses your government has caused. Minister, will you continue to run away from the manufacturing jobs crisis, or will you finally admit that you simply don't have Thank any you. ideas to create jobs and grow Ontario? Drop the clock, please. You see it, please? 
Thank you. Minister of Finance. Minister of Economic Development and Employment, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Economic Development and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I'm going to give the, the opportunity to the member opposite to apologize and correct the record because, quite frankly, he's scaring the heck out of Ontarians when he comes up with figures like a million people unemployed. He knows the figure is roughly half that figure. So I'm going to invite him, give him the opportunity to correct that record. And I want to tell him that they, we've got a jobs plan. The problem is that that party opposite isn't supporting it. And I know that it pains the member opposite that his party didn't support the Southwestern the member from Halton. that we created a year ago. And in fact, because he couldn't hear me, I'll make sure he does. The member from Halton come to order. And in fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, of course. I know that he feels bad that his party didn't support the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund because the two, the first two projects that were funded out of that were actually funded in his riding, Armo Tools and Lampton Conveyors, which together created more than 120 Answer. new jobs and sustained more. And together, that Southwestern Ontario Development Fund has already created and retained more than 7,000 jobs. Thank Mr. you. Speaker. Your question, Peter, the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the acting premier. An 85-year-old couple in Hamilton have been separated by the long-term care system after 60 years of marriage. Unfortunately, Gilda and Domenico Rosatone aren't the first seniors in Ontario to suffer such a cruel separation. Their son Vico has come to Queen's Park today to make it an appeal for common sense and compassion. When will the Liberal government respect the principle of spousal reunification in long-term care and bring Gilda and Domenico Rosatone back together? Acting uh, uh, Premier, uh, thank Deputy you, Speaker. Premier. And of course, we are committed to getting uh, spouses back together, Speaker. That's why we have, have uh, changed our rules in long-term care home to facilitate spouses being together. It's important, Speaker, if a couple have been, have been together their whole adult life, we want them to be together for the rest of their life, Speaker. The member opposite raises an issue that we are looking at, Speaker. It's an issue when, when one of the, um, one of the uh, couple is in long-term care and the other is in a retirement home. This is a different issue, Speaker, but it is one that we care about, and we are exploring what we might be able to do. But in the meantime, Speaker, I know every single CCAC in this province is committed to getting couples together as quickly as they can, and I would urge uh, the member opposite to, to encourage this couple to continue to work with the CCAC. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, wanting to change things isn't good enough. Actually, getting to the action of changing things is what the people of this province need. The acting premier knows full well that this isn't the way a, a six-year, six-decade love story should end. Speaker, she also knows that the long-term care system is broken if the only way for a senior to get a bed is to be in crisis in the community. This government has already said that reuniting couples in the same situation as the Rosatones is "quote unquote" the right thing to do. She repeated again, it again uh, at the first part of my question, Speaker. So, will the acting premier do the right thing and bring Gilda and Domenico Rosatone back together, or are they destined to celebrate their future? Anniversaries apart, Speaker. Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, uh, as I said in the uh, in the first question, uh, the CCAC I know is working hard to bring this couple back together. It's what we all want to happen, Speaker. And I think the member opposite would be very interested to know that for the first time in a long time, our wait lists for long-term care are actually dropping thanks to the excellent work that is being done in the community because of our investments in CCACs, in home care. Speaker. We're actually seeing fewer people needing to go into long-term care. This is very good news for our health care system, and it's very good news for the people who need that extra care. Thank you. Your question, the member from Ottawa South. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Com Consumer Services. Speaker, in my community of Ottawa South, I've been receiving questions from local businesses, municipal leaders, and residents about a new requirement to call prior to digging underground for any great depth. Mr. Speaker, I know our government has always been committed to putting public safety first and that we have been supportive of initiatives that prevent damage to vital underground infrastructure and promote safe excavating practices. I remember in the past we supported an industry-led voluntary participation in a one-call-to-dig system across all utilities. 
However, Mr. Speaker, now I hear questions about a mandatory participation by all owners of underground infrastructure in a one-call-to-dig system. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please provide more insight into this new program and what, we, what are the requirements for owners of underground infrastructure and excavators. Question. Thank you. The Minister of Consumer Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Ottawa South for raising the question today. I'd also like to thank two members from the opposition, the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, and the member from Sarnia Lambton. They've taken a great interest in this file, very active interest in this file and what's happening. And just to refresh everyone's memory, the legislature passed the Ontario Underground Infrastructure Notification Act in 2012, and this makes one call the one and only point of contact in Ontario for underground uh, infrastructure locations requests prior to digging. The Act requires all owner operators of underground infrastructure to join one call speaker. Currently, all non municipal owners are considered members of one call, with municipal owners set to come on board by June of 2014. And in assisting with the implementation of this Act, my yes, ministry sir. has been working with one call to provide the support and make the transition to the Act and the day to day responsibilities of the Act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to hear that the Minister will be working with all impacted stakeholders in implementing the service. I know when talking to residents and municipal leaders that there are some concerns they want to be addressed in the implementation of this mandatory requirement. The concerns raised with me have been around membership, board composition, reporting requirements, and enforcement of the Act. Many of the stakeholders I have spoken to are looking for better clarification and direction from the Ministry on how to proceed with this mandatory call before you dig requirement. Speaker, could the minister please provide some answers around what the ministry is doing to move forward and address the concerns of stakeholders? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. And the member is right. There have been concerns raised by stakeholders, a speaker, on the implementation of the program. So we released a consultation paper on this in February, and many of the initial concerns regarding membership and board composition have already been addressed by one call in making changes to their operations and requirements. To further uh, assist with the concerns regarding implementation and enforcement, we released uh, regulatory proposals around these issues, Speaker. The proposal is based on the feedback uh, obtained during consultation, and it's available for public con comment until December 16th. I invite all stakeholders, utilities, excavators, municipalities, and so on to give us that feedback, and the minister will review and consider feedback received before we move forward. This is a very important safety issue in this Answer. province I take very seriously. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. New question? The member from Burlington. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Last week, the Canadian Automotive Partnership Council released a report on auto investment in North America. It found that Canada was not in first place, not in second, but in third, oh, trailing man. Mexico as a destination of choice for industry in investment. America. This sector represents about 100,000 jobs, almost 30 per cent of Ontario exports, and a huge chunk of economic activity. And Mexico is eating our lunch. Oh, so Billions in direct investment are flowing south of the border. This is a story that we've heard over and over again. Sadly. Most new employees get three months probation. Your appointed Premier has had 10. Wow. When will That's the Premier wow. make jobs a priority? Yeah, yeah. 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 Seated, please. Seated, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. Uh, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I don't know where the member opposite is getting her information, but Are she needs know. to understand that we're on track for a record sales year in Canada for the automotive industry. We've in fact, we have bounced back so well since the bottom of the recession. We've created nearly 15,000 new jobs, Mr. Speaker, in the sector as well. And part of that, of course, is the support that the federal and provincial governments have provided to the sector. Toyota, which is rolling out their hybrid uh, version of the uh, Lexus starting in January. The $70 million investment we did against a nearly $1 billion investment for Ford for their Oakville plant. I had the privilege, actually, of 
Hosting from Stormont, with come the to order. Of industry, a federal minister. Uh, we attended a meeting and hosted a meeting with, uh, with the Canadian Automotive Partnership Council just last week. And the message we were he hearing there is steady as she goes, can continue with the federal Thank financial you. support, and their sector is doing well. Thank you. Supplementary. Tell that to the people on the unemployment line. Right. Deputy Premier, it's not a matter, matter of whether you're doing something. It's a question of whether you're doing the right thing. Yeah, it's yeah. a question of whether you're doing enough of the right thing. Yeah. Ontario has Order. never been satisfied with a bronze medal. Absolutely. We should be reclaiming our rightful place at the top of the podium. We yeah. should own the podium. Yeah. Haven't you lost enough businesses? If your government isn't bringing its A game, you will end up answering another question. How Will you fill the economic footprint of Ontario's automotive industry? Be seated. Be seated, please. Minister. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, this is ironic because the party opposite voted against the support that we provided to the auto sector in 2008. And if they had have had their way, GM and Chrysler wouldn't even be in this province, Mr. Speaker. Instead, we have nearly 100,000 people proudly employed in the auto sector, and the spin off jobs in terms of the supply chain probably close to another Member half from million. Oxford, so, Mr. Come Speaker, to order. I'm not going to take any lessons or advice from the party opposite in terms of the auto sector. We were there when they needed their support prior to and during the recession. They've bounced back nearly 15,000 more jobs since the bottom of the recession and a record sales year this year in Canada. Answer. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The member for London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. It concerns Stuart Clark and Alicia Grayson, constituents from my riding of London West, who contacted the minister in October about delays accessing the Trillium drug program. Alicia has complex medical needs with prescription drugs that cost between $400 and $500 a month. These costs used to be covered by Stuart's employment benefits, but like too many people in London West, Stuart was laid off more than a year ago. In March 2013, Stewart applied to Trillium for drug coverage. Eight months later, his application has yet to be processed after Trillium lost both the original and replacement documentation he sent. In Stewart's words, it's almost as if they are hoping people give up. Will the minister commit to addressing these unacceptable Question. problems at Trillium so that Alicia Grayson can access the medication she needs? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I am aware of this uh, of this key, uh, case, Speaker, and my constituency office and my ministry office have been working to get uh, the, the uh, access to medication that is. Uh, uh, appropriate for for this couple and speaker for others who access the trillium plan i think it's very important to know speaker that we in ontario do have a trillium uh, drug plan which is very very important for people who's who might not be covered it, but their drug costs are very high relative to their income so speaker this is a um, this is an issue that i am looking into speaker and i uh, look forward to getting a resolution quickly Thank you, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I also look forward to a resolution. The good news is that Stewart is working again in self-employment, but he has no benefits. As a result of the delays in accessing Trillium uh, drug coverage, he's considering separating from his wife so that she can go on to ODSP to get her drug costs covered. Minister, does it make sense to you that the problems at Trillium are potentially forcing people onto ODSP so they can get access to the life-saving medication they need? Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, as I said in my the original question, this is an issue that we are looking into. And of course, I think when people uh, are entitled to uh, access under Trillium, they should get that uh, get that coverage as quickly as possible. I tell you, if the system isn't working, Speaker, I will fix it. In this case, Speaker, in this case, Speaker, we are looking into this particular issue. But the system, we're here to serve people, Speaker, and we're here to make sure that people of Ontario get the drugs they need covered when they need that coverage. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.